Evening everybody. Welcome back to Dogwood Life. Today we're going to do something a little different. I'm actually speaking uh, in church this morning and um, we're going to invite you along to listen to our message. So join us at Peace Community Church. My story that we're going to go with today uh, begins at the end of April. We were, uh, we were at Bill and Judy's, Chelsea's parents, working on uh, my pickup a little bit and everything went quick. And we went inside for a coffee and a visit afterwards. And shortly after, Arlie decided he was done. He wanted to go home. It was, it was time to go home. Um, it wouldn't be the first time that, uh, that when he's uh, finished, he wanders out, climbs in the pickup, gets in his seat, buckles up, and he'll wait. Uh, we spent just about a half hour looking for him uh, the first time he did it because he was gone. So he put on his boots to head outside, and I told him we would be out in just a second as he closed the door. We said our goodbyes, we got Remy to clean up his toys, and we headed out to the truck, only to find he wasn't there. Um, he wasn't in the truck, or the yard, or the shop, and yeah, mild amounts of panic. But he's got to be here somewhere, like where else would he go, right? Well, unfortunately, wrong. Uh, unbeknownst to us at this time, he was at the Alaska Highway trying to cross. Uh, some complete random strangers had stopped him and had just started walking him back in the general vicinity they had, that he had come from. He had no idea who these people were. They had no idea who he was. Uh, they heard us hollering for him holler and uh, assumed that, <laughs> that he was who we were looking for. And they hollered back that they had found him. Amazing amounts of relief and grief uh, gratitude and frustration and everything else all come through at once. Um, the next morning we were in church and John was speaking and I could not focus on the service at all. Uh, my brain just kept coming back to the day before and what would have happened if he had run out in front of a truck or if some stranger creeper whatever had grabbed him and we never saw him again. Uh, it was terrifying. But it dawned on me, it's like, how often do we do that? How often do we let our impatience and our independence get the best of us in our day-to-day -day situations with each other, and even more importantly, with God? As I started reflecting on this more, I realized a lot of my darkest times in my life were all around that same time where I decided I wanted to do things my way instead of what God had planned for me. My impatience with wanting things now, whether it was a vehicle or a job or a relationship, uh, often got me in situations where I found myself further away from God. Now, while I always believed in Jesus and I knew that uh, I wanted him, he was my Lord and Savior, I, I knew who he was, my relationship would suffer and drift away. Uh, not on his doing, in just on my inability to wait. So dependence on God and not of ourselves. In Exodus 2, verses 11 to 15, uh, now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, why are you striking your companion? But he said, who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses was afraid and said, surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. So if we look at Moses, he was the adopted grandson of Pharaoh. He could have as cushy a life as it gets if he had wanted. But when he saw the Egyptian beating up the Hebrew, he wanted to make that right. He didn't want to see what God had on his mind. He wanted to make it right. He wanted to do it now. He felt he was writing an error. But his independence and trying to do things his way sent his life into a very literal run. He had to flee and run to avoid being killed by the Pharaoh. Now, I, I think um, Moses will have learned a lot in this situation, but when God came back to him in, uh, later on and told him to go back to Egypt to ask for the Hebrews to be let free, he questioned things. Um, 
he basically wanted to know a step-by-step agenda of what was going to happen. And he still argued with God that he wasn't a good speaker. He wasn't the right guy. He had all sorts of excuses. In Exodus 4.14, it says, then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And he said, is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. So this is where Aaron got brought into the mix that he was traveling with Moses. Now, I feel like Moses still had a lot of questions and doubts, but he followed God's instructions at that time and returned to Egypt and until the, the king of Egypt finally chased them off. When we got out to the desert after they've been run off, the same story continues. The Lord instructs them to gather their food, but not to collect an extra for tomorrow. Just take what you need for today, except for on the sixth day for the Sabbath. Well, they tried to gather extra, and it turned. It grew worms. And then on the Sabbath, they still tried to get more. And uh, the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? The Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you the bread for two days on the sixth day that every man should remain in his place. Now, this behavior doesn't stop anytime soon. Even as God led them to the mountain and laid out the commandments, when we get into Exodus 32, we see that the people still get antsy when Moses doesn't immediately return, and they start making their own idols. So Exodus 2, or Exodus 32, pardon me, 1 to 10, and I'm reading from the NASB, sorry. Um, now, when the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Aaron said to them to tear off the gold rings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand, and he fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is our God. O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt? Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play, to pray, pardon me. (laughs) Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I have commanded them, and they have made for themselves a molten calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it. This, and said that this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, have you seen this people? And behold, they are in an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make them, and I will make of you a great nation. So we need to be grateful to Moses, because at this point, he goes to bat with God as it continues on. Then Moses entreated to the Lord and to his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn your face, turn from your anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abram, Isaac, and Israel, Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens And all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to you. They shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm he said he would do to his people. I can't imagine going against God's instructions like that. But at the same time, isn't that what we do every day? Impatience and independence became the downfall of the people, as it so often does. Now, this isn't nearly the only place in the Bible we see this type of situation. 
It carries on into the New Testament with Jesus and his disciples, the people who by all reasonable thought should have had the easiest time trusting and being patient, but they were still human and still had those same struggles that we do. I often relate to Simon Peter. I like to have a plan and to be in charge. In the NIV in particular, John 18.10, Simon Peter cuts off the ear of one of the high priest's servants when they're coming to arrest him. Even though as often as he's been told by Jesus that this is what has to happen, this is the role of his crucifixion, pardon me, and he's ready to fight. And I get it. I'm sure I'd be no different. But this is something that I'm being reminded of and prompted about often lately. I want to live my life where I feel God so closely that I recognize his voice when he's talking to me. I don't go back and forth questioning, is this God or is this something that I'm trying to do of myself? I want it to be God and I need it to be God. If my walk isn't Christ-centered, then what am I even here for? Over the past several months, I have felt significant improvements in this as our church is open, our small groups are meeting again, and we're connecting again. I never realized how much I took that for granted until we were told we weren't allowed to. I am so grateful to the people of our church and the encouragement we receive and the vulnerability that we often see amongst each other. This is what I feel we need to see more of. Dependence on God and not of ourself and dependence on our church family to build each other up, to encourage and strengthen each other and to be there when we're struggling. God and dependence, independence and patience in the church rarely seem like they are a good thing. We have to be able to learn to lean on each other and to trust each other, and not just all of us leaning on our pastor. So speaking today on Father's Day wasn't my initial plan, um, but it ties together regardless. On Father's Day, we celebrate our father, our earthly fathers, and I'm very grateful to have my dad, my father-in-law, and grandpa here with us today. The many ways But every day we need to continue to celebrate our Heavenly Father as He loves and protects us the same way as our earthly dads have growing up. That desire of independence, it starts young, as we were talking about with Arlie, and it doesn't necessarily go away as we get older. But as we grow up and we become less dependent on our parents, we still need to continue to depend on God and continue to grow in deeper in that relationship with Him. I never really figured out how to close it off of that. Um, I just, it it was a story that that hit me thinking about it with Arlie and how, how much our entire dynamic could have changed over the course of that day. And I couldn't just not speak on that and, and like say it, it really struck me as God saying, okay, you know what? Yeah, now you see that independence in your kid causing you these headaches. Oh, what do you think you're doing to me every day when you don't? Uh... <laughs> so, yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit and I will close it off on prayer there. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, this group of people that have come together. And Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen us in you, Lord, that we would depend on you and wait on you and your plans. Um, In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I hope you were able to be uh, encouraged by what we were talking about today and that, uh, that if God's trying to tell you something through this, that you would be listening. I know for me it's really... um, Oh, I mean, that's where the whole message has come from, that I need to start paying more attention to him and not trying to do things on my way and my time. So thanks for joining us here at Dogwood Life. Uh, remember, like, subscribe, uh, and check out our, our social medias, our Facebook, our Instagram, and our website at uh, dogwoodventures.ca. Have yourselves a wonderful day, and we will see you next time.